Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Rahim. Welcome to Islam Vision's Islamina, how non for profit 501c3s can benefit from the $365 billion stimulus package. Sound Vision has been bringing leading quality content for almost three decades to the North American Muslims and has now become a pioneer in professional, professional development trainings. In these uncertain times, when we are housebound, we cannot stop learning nor moving forward. And Sound Vision's team has been working long hours to adapt all of our trainings to an online portal. I am Sadiq bin Abdullah, your moderator for this webinar, and I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge and thank our de uh, generous donors uh, to our webinars uh, by WIT, uh, which is an IT solutions company with offices in Michigan, Ohio, and Toronto. And before I introduce our presenters, I would like to point out just a couple of uh, housekeeping rules uh, so we can have a streamlined experience, inshallah, hopefully. Uh, number one, uh, at all times during the webinar, please keep yourselves on mute so we can have an uninterrupted session. And number two, uh, if you can use the chat box that will pop up on your right hand side, if you press the chat button on the bottom of your screen, uh, I will take all of your questions and then we can answer them at the very end of uh, each session. So we'll have some a lot of time uh, for Q&A uh, after each uh, presenter is finished. Uh, now I'd like to introduce uh, our first uh, trainer, our first uh, presenter of this session, uh, Terry Allen. Uh, Terry Allen is a veteran uh, political and legislative st uh, strategist uh, with expertise on a board uh, uh, range of issues ranging from technology, energy, you know, judiciary and telecommunications to tax, trade, uh, healthcare, and nutrition policy. Uh, with over 29 years of professional experience in government, politics, and public policy, uh, Allen, uh, Terry Allen has delivered uh, results for uh, Fidelis clients through practical understanding of the legislative and decision-making processes and through building strategic partnerships and diverse policy and political coalitions. Uh, as founder and president of Fidelis Government Relations, uh, a strategic consulting and government relations firm based in Washington, D.C., uh, Terry Allen has presented some of America's leading uh, companies. Uh, for over six years, uh, Terry Allen has served as chief of staff, a former NFL uh, Hall of Fame wide receiver and U.S. Representative uh, Steve Largent, uh, managing all aspects of, Congress, of the congressman's legislative and political agenda in 1998. Terry Allen managed Representative uh, Largent's uh, race for House Majority Leader, which has decided on third ballot and unprecedented uh, feat for a two-term House member. Uh, so without further ado, uh, Terry Allen, please uh, go ahead. Terry, you're muted, sir. Sorry about that. I heard a little bit of, um, of, uh, of, of uh, cracking up in the audio in the last, uh, in, during the introduction. So I'll try to speak slowly. Um, so this, uh, the CARES Act that was passed on the 27th of March is truly unprecedented. Uh, we've never seen anything like this. I've been on Capitol Hill for 34 years and I've never seen this type of bill passed so quickly and of the quick form was big. It is the largest bill that's ever been signed into law um, that was not an appropriations bill that didn't actually just fund the government. It's it, that the, on the regular ongoing annual uh, uh, appropriations process. This was a new New authority created, new new law created for two trillion dollars, uh, which is in the entire federal budget's a little over four trillion dollars. So this is this is a huge huge piece of legislation. Within that two trillion dollars of support, there's sixty five billion dollars worth of direct payment in through the next sixty days, and that's what this is about. So today. Um, we're going to uh, talk about uh, that process about uh, to help you. Joe's gonna go over the details of that, my colleague, Joe Murray. And um, uh, I will just add real quick that since this, uh, 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 on Friday, the applications went live. Uh, banks were allowed on Friday morning to start receiving applications. And it's been, so it's been Friday, Monday, Tuesday, today's the third day of applications. It's been a pretty rocky start. 
Uh, this program was designed to get money to the hands of individuals and get money flowing through the economy, into the economy through the banks, using the banks as a conduit. And quite frankly, on Friday, what we saw were banks generally trying to throw up speed bumps and roadblocks to limit access to this money because of the deluge of applications that they were afraid of and concerned about. And so you found many banks on Friday and some yesterday were making these applications only available to their customers or only available to certain parts of their customer base, those who had business relationships or business loans. So some of that has been addressed, some of it hasn't been addressed. It's still a challenge sometimes to find a bank that will do it uh, because I think some of the banks are afraid of the, of the onslaught of applications and the, and the challenge there. So it's, it's, uh, it's been a, a little bit of a hiccup so far in the first three days. But with that said, I'll, I'll turn it over to Joe. And uh, I don't know if you want to introduce Joe or Joe, you want to go ahead? Joe Murray, my colleague, who's going to talk to us about the specifics, talk to you about the specifics of the actual program. Yes. So uh, thank you so much, uh, Terry. Uh, that was uh, very informative. Um, let, me see, let me just go ahead and real quick and just see if there are any uh, questions uh, real quick. Let me see here. Okay. Uh, all right. So far, uh, there's nothing. So I'll just go ahead and, and present uh, Joe Murray, uh, who is our next presenter. Um, Joe has worked in a wide array uh, of legislative policy and leadership roles on Capitol Hill in both the United States uh, House of Representatives and the United States Senate uh, with a policy emphasis on judiciary, health care, entitlement reform, and campaign finance issues. Uh, he currently serves as a senior government affairs advisor for a national rare disease patient uh, uh, advocacy group excuse me, uh, and consults for technology and telecommunications, criminal justice reform, uh, and healthcare focused clients. Joe has been a leader in a number of civic and political organizations, including local, state, uh, and national campaigns, uh, a candidate for elective office uh, for the Virginia General Assembly, vice president of his neighborhood civic association, co-chairman of a snow removal neighborhood organization, and is the 2017 Deacon Chairman of the uh, Diaconate, uh, as well as the Sunday School Teacher to fourth grade boys in his local church. He recently graduated from Alexander City Academy, uh, a local government civics course uh, designed to help citizens better engage with their community. Uh, Joe also serves as a specialist in Virginia Defense Force, uh, the Commonwealth of Virginia's uh, volunteer military organization, whose mission is to assist the Virginia National Guard and is a state senate appointee currently serving in the Commonwealth of Virginia's Disability Commission in Richmond, Virginia. Uh, Joe is also a licensed attorney in Virginia, uh, having earned his law degree from the Catholic University of America Columbus School of Law in Washington, D.C., and his BA in Political Science uh, from Rutgers University in New Brunswick, New Jersey. Uh, so without further ado, uh, thank you so much for joining us, Joe. Uh, please go ahead and begin. Thank you for that introduction, Sadoc, and Honored to be here with, uh, with you and all of the, uh, the folks who are attending here live uh, to discuss how the CARES Act uh, can benefit you, your nonprofit, and your folks that are affected by this uh, terrible and world pandemic. Uh, we also want to thank uh, Terry for leading out here as a first presenter. I'm looking forward to hear more from the Brays on the next presentation, and of course, uh, with Imam Malik Mujahid, we're honored to have served him and continue to serve him uh, on many fronts, and particularly here uh, during these un unprecedented times. Uh, Terry brought up uh, the fact of the unprecedented and uh, magnitude of this legislation, uh, which you know it bears worth repeating. This is one of the most significant emergency uh, relief legislation ever passed in the law uh, in the history of the nation, and we'll unpack. Uh, a large, uh, significant provision that uh, is aimed to help employers and small businesses who employ 500 employees or less. Uh, that includes, of course, nonprofits and religious nonprofits as well and entities and houses of worship. So uh, we'll start off on this first slide on a very brief agenda. I'm going to go really fast. Uh, a lot of you, uh, for two reasons, a lot of you maybe uh, by this time have already been kind of saturated with uh, uh, at least a high level understanding of uh, this small business provision uh, referred to as the payroll protection uh, program that is aimed to help employers, nonprofits for this particular amount, 
uh, retain their employees and stay alive. Uh, it's been very well publicized. It's a, a major component of the $2.2 trillion overall bill that has allocated uh, north $350 billion. Second reason is also because um, uh, you may have already participated in a very similar presentation last Thursday for small businesses and they overlap. So we'll go brief, we'll, 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 we'll be brief. Uh, we have about 10 slides to get through and then of course, uh, leave ample time for question and answers. Um, it's important we, we highlight a disclaimer that both Terry and I are legislative strategists uh, and federal government affairs professionals. Uh, we're not tax professionals, uh, legal, uh, legal, providing legal advice or otherwise. So, um, you know, there's a disclaimer that any specific fact pattern to your nonprofit, uh, we highly advise you talk with and consult with your CPA, tax or planning business attorney. Um, with that, too, we'll, we'll just go to the next slide. We're going to cover a very brief legislative history and how this impacts your nonprofits and go to Q&A. Uh, what we'll be talking about is, as you see here on this slide, there's uh, currently four phases to uh, how Congress and the White House administration has sought to provide emergency economic relief. Uh, we apologize once again about the, about the technical difficulties that we're having. Uh, we apologize about the inconvenience, uh, but we will begin uh, very shortly. So uh, as Joe was mentioning earlier, uh, him and I presented last week, uh, and we'll be going over pretty much many of the similar concepts that we went over last week on Friday. So I'm going to try to kind of go through this relatively quickly, because most of you by now have gotten a ton of information on the CARES Act, the Families First Act, and we'd like to leave as much time as we can for questions, especially given the uh, difficulties that we had here. So we apologize, but let's go ahead and get started. So two things I'm gonna go ahead and cover this morning with everyone. Uh, about a few weeks ago, the government had passed two no new laws related to COVID-19 as it relates particularly to taxes and as it relates uh, directly to taxes and employment and payroll. Uh, the first one is a family's uh, first act for the coronavirus recovery. And the next one is a CARES Act, which has been a hot topic of discussion the past few days in particular to the paycheck protection loans. Again, anything that we give here, as Joe mentioned earlier as well, is not legal advice or tax advice. Uh, we go ahead and ask you to go ahead and take this information with a grain of salt because the information is literally changing every hour, even as early or as late as uh, last night around 10.30 Eastern time, the US Treasury updated uh, information related to paycheck protection loans. So families first, Coronavirus Response Act, what is it? So basically, it's for any employer uh, that has 500 or less employees are required to pretty much follow this particular act as of about two weeks ago. What is it? Uh, it's paying people that are sick or at home taking care of their children because the schools are off. But as a small business, you might be able to go ahead and get an exemption if you say by paying your employees, you can go ahead and get and put your business in jeopardy. Uh, again, we don't know what the Department of Labor has set, what that criteria to be, uh, but as we learn that criteria, they will go ahead and share that. But at this time, that criteria has not been uh, passed out. Joe, welcome back. Uh, Thank you. I kind of started, uh, but if you want, we can kind of tag team it. I'm just kind of fly through and then give it right back to you, and then we'll open it up for Q&A for both of us. Does that yeah, work? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great plan, Fabrice. Okay. So what is this Emergency Paid Sick Leave Act, uh, which is part of the Families First Act? Basically, if you're a company or a non-for-profit, because non-for-profits are required to follow this as well, then you're entitled to go ahead and pay your employees. So for a lot of the masajids that are currently closed or churches that are closed, you have to continue paying your imams and your pastures, right? Effective April 1st, because they're not able to work. How much do you have to pay them, right? Hopefully, as long as the imams has not been self 
quarantined because of the virus and they're at home because the masajids and our places of worships have been closed, then you're required to pay them two thirds of their regular salary up to $200 a day, right? That applies to all full-time and part-time employees, not contractors, employees that are on W-2 for your non-for-profit organization. So again, here is the same information in a different layout. So if you have any employees that, now it's not just for your imams, it's if you have Sunday school teachers, if you have an accountant that's on staff, it's for any employee that's on staff at your non-for-profit on W-2, not 1099, right? If they've been impacted directly by the COVID-19 virus, or if they've been diagnosed or uh, informed by a physician to stay home, then you got to pay them their full salary up to $500 a day, right? If they're at home taking care of the child, or if they're at home because the school or the massages are closed and the schools are closed, then you got to pay them two, two thirds of their salary up to $200 a day, right? FMLA, after the first two weeks, then they get an additional 10 weeks, right? If they continue to go ahead and stay at home, again, at two thirds of their pay, up to $200 a day, right? So when our massages pay out this money to our imams, to our other non-for-profits, then the IRS will go ahead and reimburse us 100%. The IRS will reimburse the massages 100% as long as you are within those guidelines of the $200, right? There is a poster that we should all be posting. I think Joe's going to be talking about it that as well. But if you just click on the link with the Department of Labor, uh, that poster, we should go ahead and post up in all of our non-for-profit places of worships as well once we actually open back up. So the paid medical leave as well as the emergency FMLA can work together. Uh, so the employees can take up to 12 weeks off uh, that would go ahead and entitle them to $12,000 and that would entitle to you as the employer up to $12,000 reimbursement or credit from the IRS. So how does this work? Again, let's assume Ali works for ABC company, ABC Masajid, however it is, right? He's at home because the Masajid is closed, the kids are home and he's helping taking care of his kids at home. Well, he makes $39,000 a year, which equals $1,500 every two weeks. So ABC Masajid has to go ahead and pay Ali two-thirds of his salary, which is $990 for this first pay period starting April 1st. Then the IRS will reimburse ABC Masajid the eight, eight, uh, 990 gross, as well as all the payroll taxes except unemployment taxes that you've paid out. So in a nutshell, again, you will be reimbursed everything that you paid back out to your imam. CARES Act. <clears throat> what is the Coronavirus Aid Relief and Economic Security Act that was passed about two weeks ago now? In those two weeks, again, the biggest thing here is the Paycheck Protection Loan, right? I would urge every single masajid, every single non-for-profit to apply for the Paycheck Protection Loan. What does it mean, right? It means any non-for-profit, any 501c3, any sole proprietor, any business, as long as they have under 500 employees, they qualify to apply for the Paycheck Protection Loan. Again, it opened up on Friday. Apply, it's a first come first serve, so apply at your earliest, work with your accountants to go ahead and get whatever information. It's a relatively simple application. Chase Bank went online, uh, I believe yesterday from what I've heard. Uh, Wells Fargo and Bank of America went online on Friday and Saturday last week. What is it? It is a loan, right? There is no uh, ambiguity about what is it. It's a loan given by the bank that's approved directly by the SBA. The loans are 100% guaranteed by the SBA. You don't need to go ahead and have any board of director personally guarantee it. There's no fees for the massages to apply. There's no collateral that the massages have to put up. There's no prepayment penalty, right? It is a loan that needs to be repaid with interest at 0.98%, less than 1% interest rate, right? And there's no payments for the first six months. 
So, but if you apply for it, there's a loan that can be forgiven, right? So basically when you apply, you have to certify a few different things, right? That the uncertainty of the current economic condition have made this loan to be necessary for us to go ahead and continue our operation, right? All of our massages are closed, donations are barely coming in, right? And then the other thing is you're gonna go ahead and use this money to pay your imams and your other teachers that are currently on salary as well as if you have rent to make rent payment and utility payments, and that you haven't borrowed another loan with the SBA in the recent days. So basically, how much of a loan can you get? It's a direct proportion of your monthly average salary, right? So whatever your monthly salary is, you get a direct proportion of 2.5 times your monthly salary, right? That includes all wages, tips, sick leave, right? Any retirement benefits that you go ahead and pay out to your employees, that's included in there as well. Again, the example, Rob's Car Wash or ABC Massaget applies for a paycheck protection loan, right? If you have $1.2 million annually in payroll cost, your average payroll cost is $100,000. So your Massaget can go ahead and qualify for up to $250,000 in paycheck protection loan. That entire loan can be forgiven as long as you use it on payroll cost, healthcare benefits, if you have any interest or mortgage or rent or utilities that you pay or any debt that was incurred before February 15th. How is it forgiven, right? The portion can be forgiven on a tax-free basis, right? So the massages don't have to pay any tax as a 501c3, right? As, as long as whatever that two and a half amount is, in our example, it was 250,000, if that is used to go ahead and pay salaries for the first two months, and then less than 25% is used on the other remaining rent and utilities and mortgage, right? We don't know what that application is going to be, but right now I'm just urging all the massages to go ahead and go with your banking institution. You have to apply for the Paycheck Protection Loan with your bank. May it be Bank of America, Chase, Wells Fargo, wherever it is, that's where you need to go on their website to apply for it. Most of the banks have already gone online. It's all an uh, online application. You don't walk into any branch or any location with any paperwork. The other thing is the economic injury disaster loan slash grant, right? So this is another loan that Massachusetts can apply for. Uh, as a 501c3 or any non-for-profit. Now they have said that religious-based organizations do not qualify, but the accounting community as well as the SBA community are trying to go ahead and take it up with the government to go ahead and include faith-based organizations. I attended a seminar uh, last week where they said that, you know what, I mean, even as a faith-based organization, many of our massages do stuff outside of our faith, help out people outside of our faith by doing what? Benevolence, right? Which is sadaqah and zakat. We give out sadaqah to all sorts of people. It's not just Muslims that receive sadaqah, right? So we go ahead and hold interfaith seminars, interfaith dialogue, interfaith meetings, right? So on those bases, it is our interpretation that you would go ahead and qualify for this particular loan slash grant as well. How does this work? you apply for the economic injury directly with the SBA, not through your bank, like the Paycheck Protection Loan. This one is directly through your bank, right? And then basically, you uh, within three days, the SBA is saying that they're gonna go give you an advance up to $10,000. None of this is forgiven. So a lot of the massages are somewhat shy from taking this because none of it can be forgiven. Right? It's just a loan that you go ahead and pay back at a future date. They're saying within, uh, I believe, 33 years or 10 years. I don't remember. Uh, but all of it is a loan. None of it is uh, forgiven. If you get the Paycheck Protection Loan and the economic injury, then you'd have to go ahead and potentially combine it. Or Now, one thing is, which is amazing, is if you apply for the economic injury, and your application gets denied and you receive an advance of let's say 2000 3000 5000 or 10000 that advance is forgiven and you get to keep it so there is some benefits even for our massages to go ahead and apply for this because if they go ahead and deny if they being the SBA 
denies your loan, whatever advance that you have received, you get to keep on a tax-free basis and with no obligation to go ahead and repay that. Employee retention credits. Again, I'm gonna kind of run through this quickly. Uh, all I'll go ahead and just say is if you go ahead and not receive the paycheck protection loan or the economic injury, then the employers can go ahead and still get a social security credit uh, and not have to pay social security on your employees. Again, I have uh, several examples due to time limitations. I'm kind of just gonna fly through this and kind of take them at the questions and I'll have Sadik or Taha go ahead and send out this presentation to you and you can reach out to us directly on any questions. Again, I'll just go through the example is basically if you go ahead and pay any wages to your employees, then 50% of their wages, up to $10,000 in wages, you can go ahead and get back as a credit from the IRS, right? So if you pay $10,000 in wages, you don't have to pay social security on that, as well as whatever up to five Gs per employee, you can go ahead and get back as a refund from the IRS. That's pretty much it in terms of my presentation. Uh, Joe, I'll kind of give it back to you if you'd like to kind of go through what you have and then we can kind of tackle questions. Uh, so I, I frankly think that when I logged on back, the course of where you were seemed to have covered pretty much most of my presentation. So I would suggest to Sadak and Taha and Imam to uh, let's just proceed with, with Q&A, frankly, is my suggestion. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Brother Tabrez. Uh, it was very informative, very beneficial. Um, there's a lot, to, lot, lot of information there. Um, I think you know, if and when we do share the uh, presentation, I think many of the uh, participants uh, here will uh, greatly appreciate that as well. Uh, so let me go ahead and just take a look here. Um, so one person is asking, uh, as a for-profit business, will we have to pay taxes on this forgivable loan or grant? If not, how will we report this in our finances? So I'll go ahead and answer the first part of that question. For right now, they are saying it's forgivable on a tax-free basis. Uh, how you're reporting it, we, again, I haven't kind of, even as an accountant, thought through that. For right now, I'd say, again, let your accountant worry about how to go ahead and report it on your financials, but it is on a tax-free basis. Let's see here. And then another question that we had, uh, here. Yeah, I think, I think people are just asking about uh, having the slides uh, shared. So hopefully, uh, uh, Brother Taha, if you, uh, Brother Tabrez, uh, Joe, and Terry, if you can send your presentations uh, to Brother Taha. I think, I think Brother Taha has all the contact information uh, for all of our participants for today's session. Uh, then he can uh, uh, proceed. Can that. Well, thank you so much, yeah. Um, regarding questions, let me see here. Okay. Is EIDL forgiven? How can we follow up about the status of our mosque application? So EIDL is not forgiven unless your application gets denied. Uh, if you have already applied on the SBA website at this point, you just have to go ahead and wait for the SBA to reach out to you. Uh, that's all I can say, unless Joe, you have more intel on that. But right now we don't have any other intel besides that. No, that's the only intel I have, except I think it'd be worthwhile to braise for you to unpack a little bit on the interaction between EIDL and PPP. Because I, I thought if, if, if a borrower also applies for PPP and then the EIDL proceeds get um, wrapped in and there is a forgiven part, but it'd be great for, the, for you to hear that, for, our, for folks to hear your explanation again. Sure. If you have applied for an EIDL for your non-for-profit, you can still apply for a PPP as long as you use both loans for two separate purposes, right? You cannot use EIDL for payroll and the PPP for payroll. If you do, then they will go ahead and roll over whatever you received in the EIDL as part of your PPP, or if you were denied the, uh, if you were denied the EIDL economic injury disaster loan, then whatever advance that you've received as, is included as part of the forgiveness as part of your PPP loan, right? Unless you use it for two separate purposes, you cannot have both at the same time. Okay, 
Uh, I think, so there's two questions here, I think, but the, and they go hand in hand. Um, so I'll just go ahead and, and, and just read them off. Uh, first one says, I heard the loan is forgivable, but you have to pay interest on it. Is that true? Um, and the, the second question, which goes kind of with this one is, uh, if it is forgiven, can we return the money to avoid paying interest? So they haven't given us clear guidance unless Joe, you have some guidance in terms of the forgivable part. Uh, I've read that there is no interest on the forgivable part. And then I've read places that there is interest, only the principal is forgiven. So at, at this point, I don't want to say yay or nay either way. I've heard both things. Uh, I've had organizations contact me and said, hey, look, if there's any interest involved, our board does not want to participate in it even though we have the Ajma and Imam Abdul Malik can go ahead and speak on the ruling that was given uh, last week in terms of this particular interest being allowed. But so again, I'll go ahead and put it out there that I am not 100% sure I've heard it either way. We have not received clear guidance. Likewise. Okay, right. Thank you so much. Um, let me see here. Uh, I think, uh, Brother Tabrez, I think you uh, touched on this a little bit uh, already, uh, but I think this person just wants some clarification. Uh, can this apply also for a small masjid with an imam and or administrators who function on a volunteer basis as less than 50 employees? No, unfortunately, unless you have someone on payroll, you do not qualify for the paycheck protection. You can apply for the economic injury, but you can't apply for the paycheck protection loan. Okay. Here. Yeah, I mean, I think another person's asking a, a question that I think you just answered it. How we do not have employees, but our donations are affected because of COVID. Uh, what can we apply for? One more time, repeat the question, please. Yeah, uh, we do not have employees, but our donations are affected uh, because of COVID. What can we apply for? So I think I think you were just mentioning how uh, people can apply. You for can it. apply for the EIDL, the Economic Injury Disaster Loan, on the SBA yeah. website. Right. Uh, let's see here. Uh, for purposes of calculating average monthly payroll, can we use the monthly average from February 2019 to January 2020? I would go ahead and uh, instruct you to go ahead and please follow up with your accountant, right? Uh, there's a lot of different calculations. Uh, the banks, depending on what your bank is requesting, the banks are pretty much put in that stipulation. If you don't have an accountant, then you can reach out to me privately, but I mean, I urge every single massage that you should have outside accounting firms helping you out. Yeah. Let's take a look over here. What is the difference between family MFLA loan and PPP? Joe, you want to take that one? Can you repeat that, please? Yeah, uh, one person is asking, uh, what is the difference between the family MFLA loan and the PPP? The family FMLA loan, oh, MFLA? MFLA, yeah. It's just the expanded credit with the Families First Act. That is not a loan. Uh, the FMLA just goes and gives extra credit uh, to employees uh, for employers to go ahead and pay them out an additional 10 weeks if they're at home taking care of a child. But that is not a loan. That's strictly for employers to pay their employees and get, get reimbursed by the government. Okay, right. Uh, let's see here. Uh, one person is asking um, if Imam Mujahid uh, can reiterate the AJMA ruling about how to accept these interest-based loans. Uh, Imam Mujahid, if, uh, uh, if you'd like to make a few comments on that, please uh, go ahead and share. Um, uh, Sound Vision forwarded um, this question to four different teams of scholars. And uh, <clears throat> three of the teams of scholars uh, consider that this is uh, acceptable uh, to take, uh, uh, you know, the participate in this program of protection of payroll. 
uh, their argument uh, was that uh, although the bank and trust, all Islamic scholars consider to be uh, fall in the category of usury, which is prohibited in Islam with the term riba. However, uh, in this situation, when concern is to protect the job of other people and their livelihood, so purpose of Islamic law is to protect human life and protect their livelihood. This is the first purpose. Based on that, they determine the bank and trust of which some of, uh, you know, the government has asked that the bank who are disseminating this money can charge up to 4%. Now, this may not be 4%, it may be lower than that, but they cannot charge more than that. So they are considering uh, three of the four team of scholars that should be considered as uh, almost like bank expenses. And this money comes from our tax money given by our government for the purpose which align with the purpose of Islamic law. And therefore it is acceptable uh, to take this loan. This is the opinion of those three team of scholar. One of them is, uh, uh, I think, Amja, American Muslim, Jurist of America or something like that. Uh, their member who was participant in that uh, discussion was part of last uh, webinar and he articulated in very Islamic and very logical manner why they have reached this position. Now, one very conservative Islamic scholar, but highly respected in Islamic finance, uh, his name is Maulana Taqi Usmani. Uh, his, he gave a very brief response uh, saying that this is only allowed if there is a risk of your life. Uh, that's how he defines istarar, uh, that uh, if you have nothing else to eat for your livelihood, then harams, something prohibited, become acceptable. So he uh, remitted himself to answering in that particular way. Uh, so it is uh, uh, up to you, if you like a written answer from any of them, uh, do um, share your email and I hope this chat uh, could be preserved so we can share it with them. Uh, what are the three opinions and what is this opinion? The last opinion uh, by the scholar, he just have a, um, a recorded message in his language, which is Urdu. Uh, so, so if you know Urdu, but I already translated, it's very brief. Uh, so this is the three different opinions which has come forward. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Imam Mujahid, uh, for the clarification. Uh, let me just see here uh, if you have any more questions. But I think uh, right now would be a good time to transition back over uh, to Joe so he can commence with his presentation as well. Uh, so without further ado, uh, please uh, continue, Joe. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. Uh, Joe, uh, Joe and Tabrez, let me raise a question. Sure. Last time when we were talking in the presentation last week, one thing came out that everything which is applicable to business is applicable to not-for-profit or uh, mosque and churches and temples. At that time, the information was that people, uh, for example, um, organization name uh, uh, ABCD has some people on payroll, but other people on 1099 that those people on 1099 who can include them for payroll protection program. Uh, today I heard a uh, little differently. Maybe I was not clear in listening, but could you both clarify that, any one of you? 
Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll seek to address it and rely to the Braves, I'm sure, has uh, been looking at this as well. Um, thank you for raising that. This has been one of the uh, one of a few that matters that have been hotly debated in um, in the circles of CPAs, tax attorneys, and just folks that want to understand how to calculate that right amount of average monthly payroll costs. Uh, before last Thursday or Friday, before the SBA and Treasury uh, had released specific bank guidelines, um, our view of the statutory language led us to strongly believe that in calculating the monthly payroll cost for the max amount of loan, that in addition to employee uh, wages and other areas that the payment of two independent contractors from businesses and nonprofits and religious entities would be able to be included in total amount. Uh, the guidance that was released Thursday or Friday, Thursday night or Friday last week indicated very clearly that those payments to independent contractors were not to be included when calculating payroll costs. Uh, there's still, in my mind, even though that's that's been stated, uh, banks, I've seen bank applications um, from different fa family, friends, and otherwise that are still including that in terms of to calculate that amount. So I, I think that's a little dated though, Imam, because that was best Friday and Saturday. I believe that the clear answer is that uh, payment to independent contractors from nonprofits and employers, you know, should not be included in the overall payroll calculation. And the reason being that the SBA guidance is stating that uh, those independent contractors, sole proprietors, 1099s, are able to apply on their own uh, should they fit the other criteria. And with that, I see the brace not in yes, so I'll, I'll pivot to you, the brace. I agree, Joe. I agree with you 100%. I, I think uh, up until I'd say yesterday evening, for me, it was not clear. I was instructing all of my clients to go ahead and include the 1099s uh, up until, as I mentioned, the U.S. Treasury released guidance in a FAQ around 10.30 p.m. last night. And in there, clearly, they reiterated that a borrower for the PPP should not include any 1099 contractor, only W-2 employees. They have also said that if you have included it already into your PPP application prior to this guidance coming out, okay, you've included it. Uh, Great. So I'm, again, I've had a lot of clients, massages, for-profit, non-for-profits already apply for the PPP with the 1099s because as Joe said, the banks were asking for it. Uh, so we included it. That was our interpretation of the law. Uh, but I think as of yesterday evening, even though the guidance before the interim final ruling made it clear, uh, it was still ambiguous because one part of the law said you couldn't, one, and then another section of the law said you could. So we wanted to take the section that said we could and ignore the sec section that said didn't. Uh, and the banks, ultimately, it's up to the banks, right? Uh, every bank is asking for different pieces of information. Some banks I've seen ask for business tax returns, personal tax returns, all the 941s, all the 1099s, all the W-2s for five quarters, right? All of 2019 and Q1 of 2020. I've had, for example, Chase Bank just ask for copies of W-3 and the last quarter 941 for 2019. So every bank is kind of doing it different. Chase Bank, as of yesterday, was accepting 1099s, right? So I'd go ahead and urge everyone to apply as soon as possible. One other additional point, like Fabrice mentioned, if you'd already included payments to 1099 contractors in your application, um, it is what it is. Uh, one bank... Uh, where that was applicable, advised the, the borrower that, you know, you, you could just return that amount when appropriate. And as long as you return it, I believe, before the six-month payment period. I, I can't remember, Thabrese, if you brought this up. And I might have before I was, I was uh, the technology went poof, is there's a six-month uh, 
deferral period on repaying any of these loans. So no payments on principal or interest will, will be due within six months. And I believe if, you know, before that six month, if you just return all the money, uh, I don't know if there will be an interest accrual, uh, but I believe definitely for the principal, you won't be held accountable for that. Agreed. Any other questions that have come up? Yeah, let's uh, take a look here uh, real quick. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Sadim Sheikh is making a few comments here. Uh, the kind of long. Uh, as per the business loan program, internal final rule paycheck protection program, it includes salary wages commission or similar compensations, uh, even included tips and cash tips, even include uh, medical insurance, uh, group health insurance, local and state taxes, and an independent contractor or a sole proprietor, commissions, income, net income, and net earnings from self-employment or similar compensation. I think he was just uh, uh, kind of clarifying uh, a few things or kind of elaborating on a few things, but let me see here. Any other questions tab? If you have any other additional uh, uh, comments or questions, Let's see here. Uh, we have contractors on 1099. Can we apply for PPP? You know what, Sadak? I also see one here uh, that's a little bit backed up asking if anyone has knowledge of anybody getting the actual loan proceeds. Okay. Um, and a specific mention of Wells Fargo. Uh, I just want to say, I mean, over the weekend, we heard, we read reports of about 13,000 successful applications for PPP nationwide at an amount of uh, 4.3 billion. And then yesterday I saw about 36 billion. So almost 10% of the 360 appropriated uh, and a couple hundred thousand applications. So apparently borrowers are receiving the money. Uh, people, entities that I know have applied have all told me about a half dozen that I've asked that have had successful applications that they have not received their loan proceeds as of yet, but they expect by the end of this week. So there seems to be about, you know, a three to seven day lag period between uh, your application being submitted and actually receiving the funds. And that's just anecdotal. There's nothing really substantiating that, my observation. Agreed. I don't know anyone personally that, that has received any funds yet in terms of our clients or non for profits but from the news, I know uh, Bank of America and Wells Fargo has already started funding. So, uh, yeah, we have another question. Um, where do we find the specific bank requirements for documents? It would be very beneficial if we could be provided with the details of a few banks. Again, I would go ahead and say, go to where you bank your business checking accounts are, right? May that be with a credit union, may that be with Huntington Ridge, First Midwest, Chase Bank, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, Fifth Third, whoever it is, Devon Bank, go to that particular bank, right? Because a lot of the banks aren't taking applications if you're not their customer, or if you haven't been their customer for over two, three months. And every bank has a different list, unfortunately. Yeah. Let's Some of the hangups that I, Terry mentioned this early on, it bears worth repeating that uh, we've had some clients and family and friends that have gone to their bank that have, that they have a business checking account as the Ray's mentioned. And there's been some challenges where the bank has said, uh, you know, even despite you having a business checking account, what's required is you to have a business, a history of a business loan and or a business credit card. That was really met with a lot of uh, heartache and a lot of elected leaders that learned about that were not happy to hear that banks were stating on a technicality that even though you had a business relationship, that fact that you never had a loan or uh, a credit card, credit. which I imagine in your faith community has been well documented, um, you know, is, is, is a theological issue, uh, was really problematic. I know Bank of America has backed off of that. But if you're hearing that, please let 
your leaders here know, because then we will filter that up to uh, federal elected leaders that we know and been working on this. And, and that, that should not be the case. We, the whole intent of this congressional act is to tear down barriers to getting the money that your, your nonprofits and religious organizations need and not put up barriers. That's important. Agreed. Uh, again, some of the larger institutions had said that. I think they've backed away from it. But again, uh, I see a question here again. It says, if one bank stops taking applications to, like Wells Fargo, can you apply at another institution? Yeah, you can definitely. I know Lendio is a large small business uh, lending platform online. You can apply through them. You can apply through Intuit QuickBooks. PayPal is trying to go ahead and figure out how to take applications. Uh, so a lot of the fintech companies are trying if you haven't applied or you cannot apply yeah find another institution that will take your application there's no hurt there's nothing wrong with it do i know of any banks that will take any applications if you don't have businesses accounts with them uh i have talked to several banks uh again maybe you can go ahead and reach out to me privately and i can connect you with some of the bankers that i know uh but Again, there are several institutions without trying to throw bankers and banks underneath the bus right now. Uh, I'd say just reach out to me privately and I can try to see if I can help your business or your mission. Yeah, I think uh, those are all the questions um, for now. Uh, I'm not seeing any uh, new incoming questions right now at the moment. Uh, but yeah, uh, thank you so much for uh, presenting today. Uh, we really do appreciate it. Uh, Imam Mujahid, uh, do you have any uh, final comments? Well, thank you so much, uh, Terry and Joe. Now, Joe, being a lawyer and Tabrez being an accountant, you have covered from both sides. Uh, okay. Thank you so much uh, for your contribution. All right. And, uh, I think uh, the next one is uh, uh, just about the uh, personal uh, and employees and individuals' perspective. And I right. think. Uh, uh, Tabrez is the only one who will be uh, handling that. And uh, uh, I would like to thank Joe and Terry uh, for, for your uh, uh, presentation. I know the law, uh, wow. you know, whole thing is passed in a very fast pace. That's why uh, there was contradictions and there may be more what it is about thousand pages. And while yes. people are still consuming that, they are trying to pass a new one. So if you have a concern about some part of the economy and government are not clear, I think this is your opportunity to talk to your uh, uh, representatives. Uh, uh, so the next stimulus package uh, is better. And Absolutely. we need to all continue to keep ourselves safe and uh, keep praying that we and our neighbors are all safe and our country is protected as the rest of the humanity. So thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, well, our honor, Malik. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much.